सर यहाँ पे सर सेंटर सर यहाँ एक मिनट सर 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 यहाँ सर राइट साइड सर राइट साइड
those who subscribe to this belief think that since in Turkish the word Urdu refers to an army camp and the language was a product of interaction between soldiers in army camps, it was called Urdu. Noted author and critic Shamsul Rahman Faruqi, however, dismisses this claim. What he writes is, Faruqi Sahib writes, the belief that Urdu originated in Muslim army camps and cantonment bazaars helped generate and sustain two myths. Urdu was the language of the Muslims, and being originally the language of camp and cantonment, it stood in natural need of being refined and gentrified. And the process was initiated by the master poets of Delhi in the second half of the 18th century. Small wonder then that the name Urdu which didn't come into use for the language before the 1780s, is invariably invoked by our historians to prove that since Urdu means army, army camp, or the market of a camp, the Urdu language was born as a result of foreign Muslims and local Hindus interacting with each other for petty trade and commerce. None struggled to consider that the only foreign armies in India during and from the 1780s were British and some French. There were no Arabic or Persian or Turkish speaking armies in India from the 1780s. And the language of Urdu had by then been in existence for several centuries. Thus the name Urdu which first came into use apparently in the 1780s could not have been given to the language because of the putative army connection. A ghazal is a collection of many couplets, shayr, of the same length and following the same meter. These couplets are thematically autonomous of each other. Sometimes, though, a few of them can be read together, indicating a single theme, and when this is done, the cluster of couplets is called qita or qata. Each line of a shayr is called a misra, and the first shayr of a ghazal is called the matla. In the matla, the two lines rhyme with each other, whereas throughout the rest of the ghazal, only the second lines of the shayr rhyme with each other. The last couplet of the ghazal in which the poet's takhannus pseudonym appears as a signature is called the makta. <clears throat> now I'd like to, to, to read to you about Mirza Muhammad Rafi Sauda. In my ignorance of Urdu literature or Urdu poetry, I always assume that Urdu poets have no sense of humor. Ghali, of course, is an honorable exception. So to discover what the existence of Mirda Muhammad Rafi Sauda, whom Saif Sahib refers to as the great satirist, was a perfect, absolute delight. Sauda was born as Mirza Muhammad Rafi in Delhi in 1713 to Mirza Muhammad Shafi, an Afghan aristocrat who had migrated to India for trade. Sauda lived in Delhi's Kabuli Darwaza area, close to what is today known as Naya Bazar near Khadi Bauli, which was an upmarket neighborhood back then, inhabited by the city's elite and connoisseurs of art and culture. Those were the times when the domini or courtesan had a distinct place in society. Courtesans were not only trained in music and dance, but also well versed in poetry and would often receive influential guests for exclusive evening performances. The easiest route to reach the Qila e Mawalla, the Red Fort, the seat of the Mughal Empire from Kabuli Darwaza was through Chaudi Bazaar, then an avenue on which stood the elegant mansions of some of Delhi's best known courtesans. Such was the splendor of this avenue that, in, that it inspired the poet Rasikh Azima Wadi to compare it to the famed Mount Caucasus of West Asia. Chaudi Taf He Ya khulde bari hai rasip, jangate huron ki pariyon ke pire rehte. Sauda originally wrote in Persian for many years. It was at the insistence of a great Persian poet and Urdu scholar of the time, Sirajuddin, Sirajuddin Ali Khan Arzu, known to history as Khan Arzu, that he started writing in Urdu. 
Arzu was the author of two highly regarded Urdu dictionaries and Ustad or teacher to many an aspiring poet, including Mirza Masar, Jane Jana, and the young Mir Tati Mir. Of Khane Arzu, it has been said that his relationship with Urdu literature is equivalent to Aristotle's place in the tradition of philosophy. Unfortunately, none of his verses has been preserved. While Sauda's poetry started becoming popular around 1745 when he was in his early 30s, his fame seems to have reached the Mughal court only after two decades or so. In these two decades, much had changed in Mughal Delhi. Rangila, the great patron of the arts, had died after ruling for 28 years, and after three of his successors came and went in quick succession within 11 years, Shah Alam II ascended to the Mughal throne. In those days, rulers and aristocrats who were fond of poetry and wanted to improve their poetic skills would request established poets or scholars to mend their poems. The Hazal Banana. Though this meant changing an occasional word to either enhance the musicality or quality of a verse or to correct its meter, it is widely believed that under the cloak of mending, many rich young princes and nobles would actually get their poetry ghost written for a fee. It was a fantastic arrangement. While the broke poet, who could or would do nothing other than composing a verse, would not mind infusion of additional income, his rich benefactor would earn poetry. Something like our screenplay writers of our film industry. In or around 1765, impressed by Sauda's literary prowess, Shah Alam II invited him to the Pillai Mawalla and sought his help with his poetic skills. Sauda was a no nonsense man. Soon the emperor's royal demands began to irritate him. It is believed that one morning the emperor was insisting that Sauda write a particular azal for him and Sauda was avoiding the recitation. The emperor finally asked him, Mirza, how many azals do you manage to compose every day? Sauda replied, my lord, I manage to compose only three or four verses. To this the emperor condescendingly said, my friend, I compose three or four whole azals while I'm in my bathroom every morning. No wonder they smell so bad, said Sauda, <laughs> and came away. There, there is a, a little bit of a, a, a selection of... A, Sauda was also a philosopher of sorts. With her unmatched grace and elegance, Zahra Nigah, the celebrated Urdu poet, and one of the greatest connoisseurs of the works of Sauda and Mir, recited a poem to me, in which Sauda beautifully explains how a youngster anxious to gain quick success, visited a, a wise man and asked him for Nuskhae Kimiya, the fabled formula for the elixir which infuses eternal life in humans and makes them conquer death. The wise man told the youngster that he would give him the formula, but the elixir would work only on one condition. When asked what that condition was, the wise man replied that the elixir maker should never let the danger of a monkey Bandar Khatra cross his mind. This condition, of course, can never be fulfilled. The moment the elixir maker is done with preparing the magical portion and is gleeful and relieved that he did not let the danger or fear of a monkey cross his mind all the while, the thought of that very danger actually enters his mind. And thus, the elixir is rendered ineffective. The point of the story is that if you cannot conquer your fear, no matter. I put it off by mistake. Sorry about that. So I'll, I'll read you the poem, which is quite delightful. Kaha jaye hai ek mahavas ka haal ke rakta tha nit kimiya ka khayal. Ye sab kar ke dil ke beech apne qayas gaya ho ek mard kamil ke paas. Raha us ke khidmat mein wo chand saal kiya mau ka pa ke aakhir sawal. कि अगर नुस्खाए कीमिया याद हो तो बंदे को भी अपने इरशाद हो कहा अगर यही था तेरा मुद्दा तो देता हूं तुझको 
تو جا اور لا ہی اجزاء ہے اس کے یہ لے کر بنا مگر اس میں ایک شرط ہے درمیان یہ نسخہ تو جس وقت لے کر بنائے کبھو دل میں بندر کا خطرہ نہ لائے کہا اب تو یہ بات ممکن نہیں جو خطرہ ہو دل میں وہ جائے نہیں نہ سمجھا غرض اس کے رمز و نکات کے پردے میں تھی مرد عارف کی بات کہ اگر دل کو خطرے کے خطرے کے قابو کیا یو پھر ہیچ ہے نسخے کی لیا اور ناو ایڈ لائک یو ٹو لائک ٹو ریڈ ٹو یو بس سیلیکشن فرم دی چیپٹر آن بہادر شاہ سفر ایٹ بگنس وتھ دس ایکسٹریملی موونگ ڈسکرپشن بائی ولیم ڈیلرمبل فرام ہز بک دی لاسٹ نوول At 4 p.m. on a hazy, humid winter's afternoon in Rangoon in November 1862, soon after the end of the monsoon, a shrouded corpse was escorted by a small group of British soldiers to an anonymous grave at the back of a walled prison, prison enclosure. The beer of the state prisoner, as the deceased was referred to, was accompanied by two of his sons and an elderly bearded mullah. The ceremony was brief. The British authorities had made sure not only that the grave was already dug, but that quantities of lime were on hand to guarantee the rapid decay of both beer and body. When the shortened funeral prayers had been recited, no lamentations or panegyrics were allowed. The earth was thrown in over the lime and the turf carefully replaced so that within a month or so, no mark would remain to indicate the place of burial. This funeral, described so memorably by Dalrymple, is not of a notorious criminal or common prisoner, but that of the last Mughal emperor of India, Mirza Abu Zafar Sirajuddin Muhammad Bahadur Shah, an accomplished music composer, a revered Sufi, a distinguished theologian, a great connoisseur of art and poetry, and a poet himself known to the world as Bahadur Shah Zafar. For more than 200 years, Zafar's Timurid ancestors had ruled the larger chunk of South Asia with a splendid and ostentatious display of wealth and authority, authority frequently translated into matchless architectural wonders and fearless artistic marvels. <laughs> 